Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this Wednesday study. I apologize that we're running a bit late. Unfortunately, technology sometimes works and sometimes it's very frustrating. So, amen to that. <laughs> okay. So, at this time, as we begin our study, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his blessings? And shall we do so with a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many ways in which you are guiding our lives and the many things in which you are doing to help us to understand that which is necessary for our lives to go forward so that we may more completely walk with you, serve you, and give honor to you. I thank you for this time of study today. I thank you for those that are involved in this study and for all that you are doing to show us our value. May your angels attend us. May your spirit open our minds so that we may understand more clearly that which you would have us to understand at this time. Be with us now. Guide us and direct us. For this we thank you and for this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Yesterday, we left off dealing with this portion where Glenn had been going through why it was so important to use Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Now he segues into this with the spirit of prophecy. As the Old Testament was given in the dispensation of Christ's ministry in the courtyard, and the New Testament was given in the dispensation of Christ's ministry in the holy place, the spirit of prophecy is given to God's church in the dispensation of Christ's ministry in the most holy place, our time, the antitypical day of atonement. Though it is the work of Christ, he chose to express that work through the ministry of Ellen White, just as he chose to express himself through the ministry of the various writers of Scripture. In type, she can be found as the window in Noah's ark that admitted light to all three floors. She can be seen as the lad guiding Samson's hands to the two pillars in the pagan temple. And she can be found in the form of her books in millions of homes as the little captive maid faithfully pointing men and women to the true healer. She can also be seen working her way from the east to the west, just as the sanctuary in the coming of Jesus is described to be from the east to the west, so her first open vision was given to her in Portland, Maine, in the east, and her last open vision given 40 years later in Portland, Oregon, in the west. Christ always shows the end from the beginning. This is his personal signature. The application of his types in this point, I've never completely understood how he, how he makes these applications. Yeah, I mean, he's maybe making an analogy. But it's not really it's not really a type, right? Yeah. Um, also, the last sentence doesn't really connect to anything that he said in the previous four paragraphs. I he, find. Uh, Go ahead. He uh, said that the uh, Old Testament typified the courtyard. Right. Yeah. So I used to think that as well, but uh, my. Understanding then maybe applied it more to Christ when he came down to the earth from 4 BC mm -hmm. rather than the Old Testament. Yeah. So, I mean, this is all very poetic and so forth, but it's not all very accurate. But it's not really saying much. I mean, there's, there's a few ideas there, but he's not really explaining how to use the spirit of prophecy, you know, how we are to study it, because we have a view uh, that's quite a bit different than most Adventists. That is, we take the spirit of prophecy as the word of God. Right. So it's not just something that's uh, like, you know, if you would say like God's helping hand or something. And in some ways, some of these illustrations are more along that line. And, and people misuse, you know, the lesser light and the greater light statements in the spirit of prophecy. I mean, obviously, God's word is the standard in which everything needs to be compared. That would be true when the New Testament was written uh, with the old, right? The old was the standard. 
God's word has to agree. Ellen White has to agree. Now, is are there mistakes in the spirit of prophecy? You know, I've noticed a few times that there are some major typos um, that in different editions of the same statement, uh, there will be corrections that Ellen White has made um, herself, um, especially in some of the chronological things when she talks about spans of time. Like there's one where she talks about like a thousand years between Abraham and Christ or something like that. And it's obviously a lot longer than that, but it's just, you know, it, it's more a, what was, what's the word? You know, a thousand is just kind of a space filler, you know. So sometimes when she was writing things out, she would uh, later correct them or refine the statements. So, and as you know, Dwight, like there's lots of her her documents where she will uh, go through and edit them. And there's things that are in the margins that aren't included um, on the Ellen G. White disc, like in the letters and manuscripts, for instance, correct? Right, correct. Right. So, so sometimes she would go through and and edit things herself. So, um, so sometimes some of the things that we get on the disc are things that she wrote that she didn't edit yet, right? And the editing that she did doesn't show up. Right? I came across I came across that statement recently about the thousand years. Yeah. She yeah. said it was from Abraham to when Paul was writing you know, in the book of Hebrews when it says he entertains strangers. Yeah. So it was saying a thousand years between them two events. And then she says in another place, the similar statements says more more than a thousand years. Yeah. But, uh, so we know it's actually about 2,000 years. Yeah. And that that statement originally was in what, do you remember where it was? It wasn't in like a major book or anything. I, I could remember. try and find it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's in my notes um, in uh, that I did in 2014 on uh, chronology that I presented in Arkansas. I present that statement and just show that sometimes she has these rounded off statements where she's not being very precise, right? And I know when I was dealing with uh, Tanya Beeman, you know, she would take some statements and say they they have to be exactly precise, you know that Ellen White wouldn't be imprecise. So she would take like the 500 year statements between, uh, uh, I think it was like the destruction of the temple or something like that. And, uh, you know, Christ making a statement about the temple. I think that's what the statement was. And she would, anyway, she, she, she would try to shorten that period because Ellen White said 500 years, but obviously it's more than 500 years. So Ellen White sometimes, and I, I find that she tends to round down rather than up. Um, but, you know, that's all a little technical thing. So that, that's one of the reasons I, I could show that there's places where she's definitely rounding down. And you can always show that she's rounding down, but it's rare for her to round up. Okay, so it's uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 138, paragraph 3. Where, where she says a 1,000? Yep. Uh huh. And then Testimonies of the Church, Volume Six, Page uh, Three Four Two. She says more than a thousand. Yeah, and see that would be the original writing is in the Testimonies to the Church. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's kind of weird that they took out the more than. But anyway, it's like two thousand years, and so, mm -hmm. so those are examples of rounding down, just to like the idea of a thousand years. Sorry, it's 2,000 years from when to when. Sorry. From Abraham. When, yeah, from when the um, the strangers came to Abraham to when Paul wrote about it in the book of Hebrews, entertaining oh, angels. Right. Yeah. So she just says 1,000 years instead of saying 2,000 years. Thank you. No. But sometimes, sometimes 1,000 years is just used as an expression to mean a long time right? in an idiomatic. Yeah, as in Psalm. Yeah. Now, I, I find it interesting. Stephen is right on that with Patriarchs and Prophets 138.3. But the error is compounded by another one of those compilations 
because in the story of Pope, it it gives a sentence that says, God called Abraham to leave his native land and go to Canaan. His descendants who became known as Israelites lived there until a famine drove them to Egypt, where they were later enslaved. Here is the amazing story of how God liberated those who were living under Egyptian captivity more than a thousand years before Christ. Okay. Now, while they leave the more than in there, it's interesting that they would use that kind of a statement. So, yeah. But anyway, the, the point that I'm making is that that uh, there are times when a person could pick at a statement in the spirit of prophecy, just as you can pick at statements in the Bible and say, you know, it's imprecise um, or it's, you know, it's incorrect. But depending on the purpose of the statement, right? So, so, so we take the spirit of prophecy as the word of God. You know, it's the same, same inspiration. Now it has a different role as far as when you're presenting to others, you're not going to be using it as an authority because they don't have it as an authority yet. At least that's my personal understanding, right? As Seventh-day Adventists, we should take it as an authority, but you know, we would, with other people, we would start with the Bible. And like if I was dealing with a Jew, you know, and somebody from Israel, I might be starting with the Old Testament and not so much the new, but I would show how the new agrees with the old. And I would do the same thing with the spirit of prophecy as I'm showing people what, because I do show non-Adventist spirit of prophecy, the insight that she has into things. But obviously they're going to, not necessarily accept its authority at first. But Adventists have sort of abandoned Ellen White as any sort of doctrinal authority, right? Taking some of her statements about the scriptures and, and then saying, well, she doesn't put herself on a class with the scriptures. What she does as far as inspiration is concerned. But obviously she has to agree with the scriptures, right? We can't say, well, you know, Ellen White says this and I don't really care what the Bible says. You know, if we have some interpretation, <clears throat> any thoughts on that? In these kind of situations, either we have chosen to accept the spirit of prophecy or we are not. And mm -hmm. the validity for the spirit of prophecy is either to be on a par with that of the other prophets or it is not. Right. Yeah. So for most Adventists, she's just become a devotional writer. Right. And, and sort of, you know, equal somewhat to Martin Luther for Lutherans or John Calvin for Calvinists, you know. Uh, but the point is here, he doesn't really tell us anything about the spirit of prophecy that's useful as far as how to study with it. No. One of the, one of the challenges that I had, and this, this is a, a personal thing alone, I had made the comment to him at one point that for me, I needed to study in the spirit of prophecy just as I would study in scripture according to Miller's rules. Mm -hmm. I needed to bring all of the passages that were written on a specific subject together to consider how these needed to be related and how I was, how I was to see these things. Mm -hmm. And he was quite adamant with me that I was wrong, that we cannot do that with the spirit of prophecy. So what do we do with the spirit of prophecy then? Well, I'm just stating this was his direct comment to me. Yeah, but he didn't really explain how, how then does he use the spirit of prophecy? No. Yeah, because he doesn't really explain here how he uses it. it it's, it's more like it's, it's some little help. Um, but it's not a major issue. Like we don't dig into the spirit of prophecy and look for all of her statements or anything like that. It's just she said some helpful things. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, under his banner of conclusion, in the consideration of this proposal, two things should stand out clearly for us. One is that the Holy Spirit gave these specific tools to our pioneers for the express purpose of laying a prophetic foundation for the church that could never be moved. The second is the realization that the Holy Spirit blessed them 
and the use of these tools that he himself gave to them. In other words, each point in this proposal is not the product of a human mind. Instead, they are the direct result of the moving and the power of the Holy Spirit upon the human mind. Using the principle of Christ's personal signature, his ability to demonstrate the end from the beginning, assures us that if we are faithful to apply these tools to the study of Daniel eleven thirty-one 31 to 45, he will then bless us with the correct interpretation of this prophecy, just as he blessed our pioneers with the same. As we once again give the trumpet a certain sound, the acknowledgement will come of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing that thou couldst reveal this secret, Daniel 2.47. Okay. Well, the first paragraph is the first time that he's actually given a conclusion that's kind of a conclusion. Okay. Right. So he's actually stated what he has stated earlier. Um, but he hasn't really said what the proposal is, other than, I guess, the idea is that we use these tools. These are tools that are given for us to study. It doesn't specifically say how to use all of them. Right. Right. But like these are the tools that you got. Now, then he's also going to talk about, basically, God declares the end from the beginning, which he has mentioned at the last sentence of the previous section. But he has never illustrated this, and he's not really saying how this I mean, I would agree that it's part of God's signature, though I would say uh, numbers are more connected with uh, Palmoni, at least that's his signature. So Christ does show the end from the beginning, but he's not illustrating how we're doing that. Correct. So, so it's like he's, he's added this thing to this whole section, hasn't explained it. So like somebody reading this might not, not even know what he's talking about. When it comes to that, unless, you know, we already know that principle. So at this point, he's now concluded his number seven, which was to be a proposal. Yeah. Now, normally when you give a proposal, you would state, I propose to prove the following, or I'm going to show the following. Mm -hmm. And in this case, he's already made a conclusion saying, these are the tools that should be used. Mm -hmm. But he's not offering much as to why they are valid to be used. And also how to use them more right. specifically. Now, I mean, we're doing this because we're, we're trying to learn something from this about ourselves. Right. Um, so, you know, we, we've been studying for, for a, lot of, a lot of years, you know, like online, but also even prior to that, we've been studying God's word. And the part that I think that really needs to be presented, you know, which I emphasize a lot, but when we deal with Miller's rules, that this is the Holy Spirit teaching us that definitely God has given us tools, right? One is we also have nature, uh, which he doesn't really mention, but he doesn't tell us like how to approach studying the scriptures. Like, I mean, if he's going to give a proposal, what I would do is I would say, first thing is we need to recognize that all light that comes from God's word is to bring conviction and power to our lives so that we can change. And that's the reason we study the scriptures, to bring light into the darkness of our own hearts. And that, that's why we pray before we study and, and we constantly pray. But, you know, we, we want to know we want that truth to affect us. And then when it, we come, you know, when it comes to studying, we're always going to be faced with things, ideas, like the 2520. And how do we approach that? Do we, you know, trust what the church says about it? Is the church as an authority? He hasn't really addressed what Ellen White says about uh, the pioneers and what role they have in our assessment of what is truth. So he doesn't actually deal at all with what new light, how do we approach new light, and then how to assess what other people are saying. You know, so there's not really much useful here as a proposal, right? So if I was going to do this, just, just me, you know, if I was going to lay out, hey, I want you to study, I would explain more clearly the purpose of Miller's rules 
and um, the purpose of Bible study. And, and the question, you know, that I would always ask is, is it true? Right. When I hear something, is it true? How do I know that what I believe is true or not? And, and he hasn't really approached any of that. No. But it's the things that we need to know and that we need to ask ourselves. It is the major problem in this movement and within within Adventism and also within Christianity. You know, often we ask, well, who advocates this idea? That, that's really, really common in Adventism, probably everywhere. Well, who's teaching it, right? You know, if it's somebody that you like that's teaching it, then you're you're inclined to listen to it. If it's somebody that you've already written off or somebody that the church has written off or other people have labeled or other people have said bad things about, then you're not even going to look at it. And so, you know, it's a pretty simple question. Is it true? How do, and then of course, it reminds how- me of. Sorry, Theodore. It reminds me of, of the Jews saying, have any of the scribes and Pharisees testified of him? You know, referring to Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and it, it's, it's it's part of human nature. You know, we all know, you know, how sales work. You know, if you go into a, a store and you see a bunch of women rummaging around, you know, in a bunch of fabric and you're, you know, a woman who wants fabric, you know, you're going to start going in there and you're going to start buying stuff that you wouldn't even have bought if you had time to think about it just because you don't want somebody else to get it. Right. Or, you know, you know, other people are buying this product. It's really, really popular. And well, then it must be good. Right. Um, you know, we sort of think that way. And then there's some useful things um, in in being able to think like that in just everyday life. It doesn't always work when it comes to uh, what is true. So anyway, that's just that's my opinion about what we've read here. The next section where we're going to just review, right, the next uh, three right. papers just sort of. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And so, so what he's going to do while you're just getting that set up is he's going to start saying, well, okay, he does follow some logic through this because he's going to talk about the proposal. And basically, I, I guess he's proposing that we use these tools to study this issue of the daily. Okay. Right? That's, what, that's what he's going to do. So, so we went through that. And so before we even get the, the document up, he's going to have this little introduction. And then he's going to talk about the law of genetics. And then he, well, at least he has a subtitle of the law of genetics. Right. So he says the title here of this, we're going to start with the daily. And he's, then he talks about Miller's rules in contrast to the historical, grammatical or higher critical methods, which are, I don't know about a higher critical method, his historical, grammatical and the historical, critical method or critical historical method. I always get that one mixed up. But um, Adventism has basically just named, created their own name historical grammatical to get rid of the word critical but really it's the same same uh, hermeneutic right anybody knows anything about that i would think that to be correct yeah so they they they, they just they you know it's that that play you know naming something so it doesn't sound so offensive but basically it's the same idea and when it comes to you know one of the things that i would bring out that that that's really different because when we were looking at um, David H. Steele's uh, criticism of um, Lewis F. Weir, well, Lewis F. Weir really brings out the symbolic nature of Scripture, especially in relation to numbers. And, and that's one thing we see in Miller's rules. These are really downplayed in Protestant understanding of Scripture. And, and I've mentioned this before. When I first became an Adventist and I got my hands on uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, um, and I read quite a bit of, quite a bit, well, I read all the introduction stuff. And, and they were quite clear that there was this way of studying that um, it was sort of a, a kind of a, a mockery of, of um, how, the Jews studied, right? They looked for these hidden meanings and then, you know, they looked for numbers and words and gematria and all these types of things. And that basically, 
that we should use any of those types of ways of study. But if, if you have the hidden meaning of scripture override the direct and straightforward meaning of scripture, I would agree, right? So you're not going to find something hidden in the scriptures that's going to contradict a plain statement of scripture. What you should find that's hidden in scripture are things that support the plain statements in scripture. Correct? Right. Right. So, um, you know, and an example uh, would be, you know, when I look at uh, the word seven times in Hebrew, and I understand that in Hebrew, they use things like puns, plays on words, you know, in Daniel 9, 11, when it's going to uh, talk about uh, the oath, right? The curse and the oath, and the oath there is seven times. Any Jewish reader is going to recognize that that's connecting to Leviticus 26. It's not using the exact same word, but it's using a word that's based upon it, right? So it's not saying Sheba, it's just saying an oath, which is to swear seven times, right? It's based on the same word, seven, right? So the seven that's in the law of Moses. So you know it's referring to Leviticus 26. So that's going to support what we already know. It's not going to contradict scripture. But if you had, you know, and sometimes with the Jews, uh, they would have something that's hidden, which, which directly contradicts the plain statement of scripture. And a lot of it would be very fanciful as well. So I'm pretty familiar with lots of the Gemara and uh, uh, these some of the rabbinic wild interpretations of things that are supposedly hidden. And we don't do anything like that. But because there it's been misused by the Jews and others, you know, Adventism thinks we can just dispense with it altogether, which I don't think is reasonable. So there is ways in which, like us using Strong's numbers, pretty bizarre stuff in some ways. No Protestant would use Strong's numbers and look at them as spans of time, or very few Protestants would. But there are some who have taken those numbers and done very similar things that we have done. And uh, so it's kind of interesting. Okay, any any other thoughts on that? Just that introduction there, right, about the different methods? Not really. I mean, the, the situation on, on this portion, when he wanted to introduce that there were three separate arguments, the... The problem that I'm having with this is that the one that is found using Miller's rules is confirmed by the spirit of prophecy. So there's really only two arguments. There's the new view and the old view. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not really. Well, well, he's trying to, to say, well, Ellen White made this statement about the pioneers uh, agreeing on the new or the, on the old view of the daily. Right. And then I guess he's trying to say, well, Alan White makes this other other view. But so I don't know what the third argument is found in the con confirmation of these two, like that is of Miller's rules and the daily is paganism. That just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I'm not sure what he means by that. So coming down to the third paragraph and and basically skipping over the statement. As we've already seen, most people in Adventism, especially our scholars in the BRI, subscribe to the new view of the daily. Agreed. So here we have a good example of a paragraph that uses a lot of words but says very little. Yeah. But, you know, the question is, is he not really formulated his ideas well when he's writing this? Like, you know, in some ways he says that he's, you know, going to present things and he doesn't really present things and then he he introduces ideas he doesn't develop them um i don't think he mentioned the bri in the other articles that i remember i could have missed that i'd have to go back through that yeah but but, it, but he hasn't really even presented what the new view of the daily is at this point right and I'm not even clear that he understands the old view of the daily, other than that it is paganism as a word, right? Correct. 
which no. which was part part of the problem that I had when I first heard about the daily being paganism is that it wasn't it didn't seem like anybody knew what that meant. Well, the issue that that I have had on a personal basis when paganism or more correctly when the daily is being mm -hmm. introduced in Daniel 8 it is introduced being joined with something else and we have this this little word and because in Daniel 8 the verse is reading so I'm going to go down here to Daniel 8 11 yea he magnified himself even to the prince of the host and by him the daily was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down so we have a party that is taking away the daily and the place of the daily sanctuary and in this case the taking away is actually lifting up and exalting correct and that's Ellen White basically presents this view in the Great Controversy, never referring to it as the daily or anything, but she's basically presenting this idea. If we had, you know, if if the first time I had ever heard of this issue, if somebody had just, you know, said, here is what the pioneers taught about uh, paganism and its relationship to papalism, well, I would see it in the spirit of prophecy. And, you know, if they never... And they would, and if they just said, well, here's what's being addressed here in Daniel 8, this is the same thing. This is what Ellen White's referring to. And that she, that the daily then is this paganism and the abomination of desolation, which we already understood was papal Rome. You know, that's just showing that uh, how that development happens. And then in 1131 and 1211, where it talks about the taking away of the daily as being a removal of them to make room for papalism, the abomination of desolation. And that's what's being talked about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I would have had no problem, right, saying, okay, that makes perfect sense. But that's not generally what people understand or people explain anyway when they are addressing this. Usually what they do with the daily is it's always about what Ellen White's statements say, where, well, uh, the daily is not important, right? Basically is what people will say. Right. Yet they're still going to promote the new view of the daily, right? So they're saying you shouldn't promote the, the daily. It's not an issue. But we're still going to promote the new view. You just can't pr promote the old view. But you see it's very similar to the discussion regarding the 2520. It's like, well, is the seven times in Leviticus 26 intensity or is it referring to a period of time of seven years, right? So, so the arguments that have been formed around uh, these types of issues never actually look at, at the, the understanding that's connected with these things. It's always about, you know, some word or some statement that the argument centers around. So like, for instance, if somebody says they re researched the 2520, and they've rejected it. One thing you can almost be certain of is they have no idea what it is, right? Right. Agreed. And the same thing with the daily. Well, the daily is not paganism. And you can see one thing they've never did is study what, what the pioneers meant by the daily being paganism, right? So they're, they're not going to understand the issue. They're just going to deal with it as, as an issue that they have uh, spirit of prophecy, prophecy statements that either support or don't support, whatever, right? So, so he hasn't done anything to help us here in this whole study of the daily, actually, you know, when you go through all of this. Right. Right. He, he, he hasn't added anything to the discussion. He hasn't shown us, he hasn't made anything really clear so that we could understand how to make that decision. And he hasn't applied Miller's rules in any way to, to show anything, right? So, so he has talked about Miller's rules, and as we see, he never uses them. Now, then he's going to talk about the law of genetics. Mm -hmm. So, well, at least he has it as a title, but he never tells you what it is, and he never illustrates it 
in any way that I know of. And I'm not sure what he means by the law of genetics. Do you know, do you know what he means by that? No. Okay. So in this in this type of a situation, yeah. it's you know, it's it's nice that there is this title, but when you're not willing to provide any kind of a support for your title, it just it's it becomes something that drifts. Yeah. Well, because you know, I was kind of interested when I first read the law of genetics. What is this going to be about? But I have no idea what it what he means by it. Um, okay. And I'm not able to find anything on the internet in internet about it really, other um, than when people are talking about basically descent, right? So, so he introduces this sort of intriguing kind of law, but he doesn't explain what it is. Well, the the difficult yeah. thing here yeah. again for me is his initial statement is as we begin the actual study of Daniel 11, 31 to 45, we are not going to attempt to go into the minutia of every position that is set forth. Well, in, in reference to this, I believe we're aware that another layman, Heidi Hikes, had produced what was called the Daily Source Book or the Daily Handbook. The, the Daily Source Book. Okay. Where yeah, so he did a bunch of source books. He did a 508 source book, a 538, a 1798, 457, seven, uh, 1844 source book. Right. So he put all these source books together. He wrote the Daily Source Book. And in each of the source books, he talks about the daily in the introductions, his interpretation of them. But basically, the source books, he just gives you lots of different statements, either historical statements or spirit of prophecy quotes or different quotes, so that you don't have to go looking for them all over the place. On the Internet, they're all together in one book, basically. Okay. Or in a bunch of books. <laughs> in now, this case. One comment from the chat. I suppose he means by the law of genetics, traits being passed from generation to generation. Right. So he's going to talk about visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third or fourth generation. So then he, he's basically saying papal Rome inherits uh, the characteristics of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. Right. So, but he doesn't really explain how that relates specifically to the daily and the abomination of desolation. So th there is an idea there in which you could um, he could have developed it, maybe. Right. Right. So so when he talks about genetics, the only thing is he has inheritor of a principle found in Exodus 2, verse 20, verse 5. So I don't know if papal Rome is an inheritor of the principle, uh, but the principle, I guess, is is used to some degree. But this this isn't this is about God's judgment against sin. And it's not really about uh, genetics as such. I mean, there's a little bit, I guess you could say that, you know, uh, we, we in, inherit some of the characteristics of our fathers. But this is more about God visiting the iniquities has to do with judgments against iniquity. Right. That's the way I understand visiting the iniquities. Right. So in this, mm -hmm. what he's trying to what he's trying to create is the thought. At least this is what I'm what I'm reading is that. Papal Broom has the spiritual genetics of the pride of Babylon, the infallibility of Media Persia, the false education of Greece, and then the legalism of, pap of pagan Rome. Yeah, and I probably would put the legalism of Media Persia. That's. It, yeah, and then switching, the those two, switching those two would make a lot more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would switch those two, but but then when he says we're not going to go attempt to go into the minutia of every position that is set forth, at least he should go into the minutia of. Now I was using minutia in a sort of a you know uh, 
a polemical way, right? Like minutia we usually think of as bad. But really, if he says he's not going to go into the detail of every position set forth, he should at least go into the detail of what these verses have to do. So he never actually does an actual study of Daniel 11, verse 31 to 45. But there's no way that you could study Daniel 11, 31 to 45 without studying Daniel 10, 11, and 12. Right. Right. So part of what we found is that you can't just jump into verse 31 and think you know where you are. Right. I mean, you need to understand what's actually happening and that we have other verses before that show us this connection between um, the papacy, one as being the king of the north. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> But you need the preceding verses to show show that to illustrate it. So, but that's that's what we find anyway in this this paper as we went through it. So when he's talking here about pagan Rome, in uh, if you go down uh, the next paragraph, you get, you get the characteristics. But the next paragraph after that, so he says pagan Rome in particular is set apart as diverse from the other three kingdoms. So what is diverse about it, right? He doesn't really, he lists a bunch of things, but he doesn't really understand. So what do we understand is diverse about papalism over paganism? Well, now, now here he says pagan Rome is particular set apart as diverse from the other three kingdoms. So that's Rome, right? Correct. And that's not necessarily pagan Rome. That's pagan and papal Rome. Right. Because the fourth beast is Rome, not, not pagan Rome. So... So I would just say, how is Rome diverse from the other three kingdoms? If you're going to look at the symbolism, it is the one that's represented by the strongest of the metals that are depicted, mm -hmm. but it's also the one that's the least valuable. Okay. Now, so it's kind of funny that this word diverse is used because diverse, we, we, we mean different, right? So that it's diverse. Right. But in some ways, the thing that makes it diverse is the fact that it's like all three kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Right. The characteristic of Rome is its um, ability to, in the way that it, it approached things, uh, was to incorporate um, characteristics of the nations that it conquered. So, you know, so like Babylon had a protection racket and to a large degree, it would tr sort of replace uh, the worship of the local gods with, you know, the gods of Babylon. Right. Now, in some ways, they did still allow uh, for people to worship their own gods. But um, the, the idea was really to conquer those gods. Right. If, if you understand, they, they believe that gods all had a local area. So when they conquered an area, they were conquering the gods of that area. And so that meant their god was greater than the other gods, right? That we understand that about Babylon in its uh, religion, how they approach things. Right. Okay. So, and you can see this in, in their sort of uh, artifacts where, you know, their gods are defeating the other gods of these other nations. Okay. Um, now, Medo-Persia... It was more an administrative sort of kingdom, right? So it built lots of roads and uh, had a legal system. It it allowed a lot more freedom for uh, these other uh, places that it conquered to basically, which which Rome is going to use that characteristic, where it, it, it's going to create roads and systems and waterways and and make it desirable for people to be a part of that system, right? Still has a conquering aspect to it, uh, you know, all of these kingdoms do, but just in how it conquers is different. And it's not, it's not trying to put down the other gods of the nations that it conquers. It's not defeating the other gods. So Assyria and Babylon have that characteristic. Medo-Persia doesn't. And then Greece, how is Greece different? Like, I mean, we always use Greece, you know, the false education and things like that. I'm not sure about legalism, 
what that how that would it gets legalism in there but so what is it about Greece? We could put false education, but it's it has to do with the form of government, doesn't it? I would I I'm not gonna disagree. I just I don't have an opinion on the form of government with Greece. Okay. Well well Greece is known for its democracy, right? Now it's rationalism. Now when we could say false education, I mean that's not one that I actually really attach to Greece so much. I mean, yes, obviously it's influenced our educational system, but that, that more has to do with the papacy than with Greece. So when Rome comes along, it, it incorporates all of these. So that's the thing that I think makes Rome more diverse in the sense that it's actually including all of these things. Right. So it's almost like an ironic statement in some ways, if you understand what I mean. Right. Because they're actually similar to all of these other kingdoms. But that's the thing that makes them diverse. And now we know Rome is not going to start out as a, an empire. Right. With uh, emperors. Right. It's not we're not going to have imperial Rome. We're going to have uh, the Roman Republic. So Rome is going to begin as a republic, which is, you know, sort of a constitutional democracy, a little bit different than direct democracy. So a republic is very different from a democracy. Yeah, democracy is the, the absolute rule of the people, um, of the majority, right? Where a republic has a constitution, it's restricted by a constitution. Correct. And, um, you know, so the United States is uh, supposed to be a republic, not a democracy. But Agreed. there's a most people don't really understand what that means. So anyway, pagan Rome is not diverse. It's Rome that is. Right. Agreed. Because he says pagan Rome in particular, but I wouldn't agree. I would say Rome is the thing that's diverse. And so he sort of mixes up some of these things. I'm not sure why he's not clear about that. So one is, I, I don't think with Rome, you, you have a system of false education like pagan Rome. So he's going to talk, be, he's talking about pagan Rome. And I'm not sure what he means by a system of legalism, because I don't think that's really a characteristic that we would have pagan Rome. I mean, unless you just mean has a legal system. Do you know what he means by that? I don't. Yeah. And also pagan Rome, it's not about false education, even. So that's why I'm saying that that's not a characteristic that that pagan Rome uh, inherits from, let's say, Greece. It's going to be the Catholic Church that really uh, creates this false education in response to the Reformation. Right. Because when does the Catholic Church really start a system of education? Not until the Protestants do, right? Right. Okay. Right. So the Protestants actually introduce education. It's it's not really a part of Rome. I mean, obviously, you know, people would become lawyers and things like that. But as far as, like, when we think of, like, the classical Greek education, the Greeks weren't using a classical Greek education. That's something that we have that has been introduced into our educational system to study the Greeks and to learn Greek and so forth. Does that, does that make sense to people? It sounds logical. Okay. So, yeah, I just think there's a lot of misunderstanding in this area. Um, anyway, so, so he's <laughs> talking here about uh, pagan Rome, but really I would put false education as something brought in by papal Rome. Okay. Stephen. Yeah, you had the, the universities come in in the, like, the 1200s. So you had the, the University of Paris, the Sorbonne, Oxford, mm -hmm. and Bologna. So would that not be sort of the education? Yeah, but that's going to start early on with the Protestant. So the Protestants are going to be there. Early well, Protestants. This is, like, this is like 11th, well, 12th century anyway, I think, is the... Bologna is the Hank's oldest. So okay. maybe Wycliffe. Maybe well, even yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's in response more to Wycliffe, not, not Luther. 
Well, the thing is, even there, these are coming about even before Wycliffe. Okay. Okay. But but it's something that's later, right? right? Well, it's, not, it's, not, it's not something that 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 starts um, right at the beginning of papal Rome, or definitely is not something that's a part of pagan Rome. Correct. Yeah. I suppose before that they would have had just the, the monasteries. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's actually where it starts to develop from is partly from the monasteries, right? Because you have a, an intellectual class that is um, developing at that time in the Catholic Church because of uh, monasticism. But but they're really quite a bit different than what happens later on, right? Uh, I mean, we could do a whole study dealing with the history of education. But So part, part of the things why you needed a university is you needed the documents for people to study, right? So a university would collect books, so that people could do research. And so you're going, it's, it's actually going to begin in um, uh, the 11th century that we start to have, um, there's a book uh, by a guy named Ivan Illich called The Alphabetiz Alphabetization of the Popular Mind, ABC. Um, the Alph Alphabetization of the Popular Mind. Very interesting book. He's uh, he was actually used to be a Jesuit scholar, um, and he started a, an independent university in in uh, Mexico City. But anyway, he goes through. He's he's an expert on uh, the 12th century. So so anyway, we we start having this really for the first time intellectuals, um, other than just independent people, right? Because you have you know you have philosophers and stuff, people. But now you're having uh, people working together. So you've got the beginning of the development of these institutions. Anyway, that's it's a long, long history. But but the point is I wouldn't I wouldn't say that the error that that Rome stands for legalism and false education. Yeah, especially pagan Rome. That's going to be more the papacy. Okay. So he's going to go through these rules of or at least one of them. So the attempt is made to divide Daniel 11 into blocks of texts. Mm -hmm. So his addressment becomes verse 2 as being Media Persia, that verses 3 to 14a is the kingdom of Greece, and that 14b through 30 is pagan Rome. Now, Media Persia and Greece were indeed kingdoms. By the time that we get to this with Rome, Rome is no longer a kingdom because we're either we're either going to be dealing with the dictatorship of Caesar or we are dealing with the very imperial Rome. So his next statement is that another block of power, a transition of power occurs in verse 31, introducing an additional block of text which it requires us to identify the new principal subject. Now, okay, now how does this relate to rule number one? It doesn't. Yeah. It's the problem. Mm -hmm. He and brings it, okay, he brings this and says this rule is to be applied, and then he wants us to concentrate on something entirely in a different area. Yeah. And and he doesn't really, I mean, sure, we can say, well, okay, these verses are dealing with these different kingdoms. But even calling it a block of text, which I find kind of an odd expression, I'm not sure why he's talking about blocks here, is that, so he says, identifying these principal subjects of the different blocks of text allow us to identify the overriding subject of the entire chapter. How so? Right. Right. And then he introduces a whole other idea about paganism, papalism and spiritualism, the three great persecuting powers. But he doesn't. So that it that Daniel 11 deals in a literal way with the three great persecuting powers of God's people. So he's saying that somehow Daniel 11 is going to be introducing paganism, papalism and spiritualism. But, but these are all just, you know, 
things that he's saying, none of it is he actually illustrating or showing. And he says that he's going to show this, but he never really shows it. He actually seems quite confused about what it is he's trying to present because he's going to argue that paganism is spiritualism, right? Is that correct? Right. Well, you're correct. Yeah. So, so anyway, this is what he does in this, you know, I just, I just find this frustrating, right? Well, it can be very frustrating. It, it's also very difficult to follow the, mm. the progression of the thought. Well, even when he talks about a new power, transition to a new power, right? Now, obviously, we have these different kingdoms. He does, doesn't really show why there's these transitions. I mean, we know that Uriah Smith says, and, and others, you know, when we have uh, this, this kingdom in contact with the people of God is really what's important. Now, in, in identifying that change, right? That's, right. that's how we would understand it. And so we don't really look at the rise of these kingdoms in the way that a secular person would. Right. One is they, they overlap. I mean, they exist contemporaneously to a large degree. Uh, I mean, Rome exists, uh, you know, before Babylon, Neo-Babylonian Empire comes to its end. Right. Medo-Persia already exists during the time of Babylon. So these these in a sense, they're not successive kingdoms, except in how they relate prophetically to God's people, right? Correct. Okay. Now, in some ways, they do uh, conquer each other. So there's that idea. But exactly where that change occurs from the secular mind is going to be different from the biblical perspective, which is often not considered by you know, critics of Adventism and, and our understanding of prophecy. So, you know, um, so I'm not really sure this this sort of model that he's placed upon Daniel chapter 11 really makes much sense, especially in relation to understanding Daniel 11, verse 31 to 45. It just seems that he's forced a an interpretation upon the text already, and he hasn't shown us and illustrated any of this. So like his, his paragraph where he says, the transition to a new power is prior to the reference regarding the king in verse 36, and there's no succeeding change of power between the abomination that maketh desolate in verse 31, the king and the king does according to his will in verse 36. So, um, so I think what he's saying there is that in verse 31, uh, there's no change in power. So the king in verse 36 must be the same as the one in 31, right? That's what he's saying there? No, I'm, I think he's saying it differently. I'm say, I think he's trying right. to introduce a, a new king in verse 36. Well, no, he says whatever this abomination power represents is the same power represented by the king in verse 36. Okay. In other words, the king is not a king, right? So he agrees with us there. The king has reference to the new power introduced in verse 31, which which I would agree with him on. So so there that that makes sense what I read here. It's just he, he's saying kind of in an awkward way, but it's it's correct. I, I, I don't I don't I think part of the problem is that word succeeding, no succeeding change of power between the abomination. I don't think he means succeeding. I think he should mean following. Okay. Does that make more sense? There's no following change of power between the abomination that make it desolate in 31 and the king that does according to his will in verse 36. The way that the way that you're stating it would make more sense because the way I've looked at it is that the daily and the abomination that maketh desolate are joined together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if that is the case, then this king in verse 36 should then be the successor to the daily power. Would that, would that be logical? Um, well, yeah. I mean, but there, for people to understand the daily, right? First in verse 31, we can see that Ellen White sums this up is that this is in the sixth century Papalism, paganism becomes papalism. I'm 
paraphrasing it, but basically that's what she's saying. It's not a new kingdom. It's a transition or a transmorphing into a new form, but it's the same power. That is, it's Rome, right? Correct. Okay. So paganism gives way to papalism, I think, is the way that it's put in the spirit of prophecy in the sixth century. So, so what we have is, is, is papalism is just paganism Christianized. It's, it's paganism in Christian garb. Okay. Now, so when it says, but this really has nothing to do with the argument, at least in the way that Uriah Smith presents it refer, regarding the king, right? So we agree that it is a king or the king, not a king, as right. Uriah Smith tries to say, that it's introducing something new. But he's he's not showing us this, right? He's not giving us any information because if there is a change of power, well, Uriah Smith just says, well, it's this new power, France, that's going to come at the end of papalism. And and we saw within within Adventism in the 1970s, and our time is almost up, uh, that we had people like Roy Allen Anderson, who was um, um, so when I first looked at uh, the the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, as we put it that way, and we look at uh, the seven heads in Revelation 17 of the beast, the view was that the power that follows pagan uh, papalism is actually spiritualism, right? completely ignoring Ellen White's statement in 1798 that the new power that arises is is the United States of America, right? So, and I would say that generally speaking, most conservative Adventists, if they're going to give you a list of the kingdoms of the seven heads as they understand them, it'd be Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, spiritualism, and then the United States, Right? That you're familiar with that, people out there? Yeah. <laughs> right? You're going to see this view uh, again and again. And it, Roy Allen Anderson, I think, is the one that really, at least in my experience, is the one that is the source of that. Even though there was other people uh, proposing similar ideas, his became popularized and then adopted and adapted by, by different people. Um, and still kind of, uh, as far as I know, it... Uh, bear sway in, within conservative circles generally. I don't know, I'm not always in touch with what's going on nowadays. Would you, would you agree with that, Dwight? Or do you see that people have put in the U.S. like we have been teaching? As well, the, the, the situation that, that I've looked at, especially where Anderson was concerned, mm -hmm. is I think that he was following and agreeing with what Prescott and Froome had been stating in, in the early part of the last century. Yeah, but they didn't really popularize it. No, but they laid the groundwork for it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so they would have laid the groundwork for it. But he's definitely, as far as I can tell, going back and all the books that I've read, it, it was, seems to be he's the main person who popularized it. You know, it could have been somebody else and he just, you know, picked it up and but in my experience, that's the way it was. But I, I don't know how much influence this movement has had in changing people's minds on the, the idea that the United States is the sixth kingdom and the UN is the seventh. I mean, it's hard for us because we're a little bit uh, myopic in that, you know, a lot of the people we know would be somewhat influenced by this movement, right? Especially right. In, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so... So I, I would think that there are at least some places where what Jeff has taught, which is in agreement with the spirit of prophecy, would be now accepted. Because right? it's pretty clear. The United States is the sixth kingdom, not spiritualism. So now we know France comes in there, right? So what they're trying to say is, well, you've got the papacy, and then you have France, and then you're going to have the United States. But Ellen White doesn't put France there. She puts no. the United States there. Now, France is there, right? So one of the things he's not really going to really address is, or at least he doesn't explain correctly, 
is how we get these three different uh, parts of Babylon, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Correct. And and so when he tries to put spiritualism really as France, well, we know that the dragon power is is pagan, paganism, right? Okay. But he, he so he's going to have the three powers. Of what what did he say they were? They were paganism, papalism, and spiritualism. And he says these are identical with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Well, they're not. No, they're not. Right. In any manner. So, so where did he get this idea? This, I, I think, this is an attempt to conflate and combine two different portions of scripture. That he's presenting an idea. He believes that he is correct, but. I don't see that this is correct. Yeah, and then he's going to argue that paganism and spiritualism are the same thing. But we know the false prophet is the United States. Right. And if he was to take this, what he says here, just this couple of sentences or this paragraph, then he would say in the, say in the false prophet is spiritualism. And yet he's going to argue that, that, that spiritualism is paganism. Right. Right. So I, I have no idea what he's trying to do, right, at this point, and even after reading all this stuff. Okay, well, we're, our time is up. But. Okay. Any other comments or questions based on what we've we've covered today? Shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we ask, Father, that you help and settle our minds regarding many of these points that we have covered. We are not trying to be critical, but we are trying to understand. Help us now as we go through this day so that we may consider more carefully that which we have considered in this study. May your will be done. May that which we do bring glory to your name through this day. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.